Welcome to this presentation on finite element analysis, constraints, and the application of constraints. My name is Mike Fiedler. I am a designated support specialist at Autodesk, and I will be working with you on today's presentation. So looking at the prior slide, what we illustrated was a shaft model with a load positioned along the length of that shaft and some bearings at either end of the shaft. And what we're going to do now is go over to Autodesk Inventor Nastran and see how we can set up the equivalent model within finite element analysis. So let's go ahead and go ahead over to Inventor. Here we are inside Inventor with this model and it is pretty much like the illustration had shown but with a few changes and really two of them before we start to set up the analysis that I should make you aware of. First of all we have truncated the ends of the model a little bit. This dimension from the end of the fillet here to the center line of the bearing was a 10 millimeter and what we did was we truncated that distance a little bit down to 5 millimeters and then there is you can see a work point another 5 millimeters away on either end of the model. So this will help us facilitate the use of the rigid connectors. The other thing that has been done with this model is we are utilizing half symmetry. So if I rotate the model around a little bit here you can see that what we have is a 180 degree section of the shaft. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're going to have constraints on either end of this and then there's going to be a force that is applied here where you can see this plane, we have also added a split line so we can add that force a little bit later. But the idea here is that if we were to take some point on this shaft, given that we have a force coming in the y direction or minus y direction, um, if we take a point at the 9 o'clock position here, the displacement of that point and stresses of that point should be the exact same as what happens at say the three o'clock position had I modeled the whole entire shaft, the full 360 degrees. So we can take advantage of symmetry in this particular case and I will show you how to set up the constraints for that as well. So let's go ahead into the Nastran environment. So I'm gonna to go to the environments tab and what we want to do is go into Autodesk Inventor Nastran and so as soon as we come into Nastran we can begin with the finite element analysis setup portion. Now the first thing that I'm going to do is not necessarily related to constraints uh, but something that needs to be done and that is define the material. So I'm just expanding the idealization and we're going to change from the generic material there. I'm going to say select material. We'll go to the Autodesk material library. Scroll down until we see the steels and we're going to take a mild steel and say OK and when we do that then you can review the properties that come in with that particular material. And we'll say OK to that. Now the next thing that we're going to do is to begin to set up some of our constraints and again as the prior slides had talked about since we want this shaft to rotate the brick elements are not going to allow for that. So what we need to do is to come up with a different means which we can accommodate this sort of motion. So the thing that we're going to utilize here uh, would be connectors. So if you move up towards the top of the screen, you'll notice connectors here on the prepare panel. So I'm going to go ahead and select connectors and we'll work on both ends of the model. Again, hopefully you can see the work point that's there. It's pretty light. Uh, but for our connector, what we are going to do is choose that it is a rigid body connector. That sets the type to rigid. And there are a couple other things that we need to do to complete the construction of this rigid connector. The first thing is we're going to select the dependent entities. So when we talked about rigid connectors in the, the slides or the text portion of the presentation, uh, what we mentioned was a rigid connector connects to a single common point and then spider webs or, or spokes out depending on how you want to describe it to a surface or an edge something like that so when we choose 
the dependent entities, what we are defining is the surface or the edge that we want it to connect to. So I'm going to go ahead and select the end of the shaft here. And you can see it selects that face. And um, we also need to define that this face is dependent upon the common node or the center point of our rigid connector through what degrees of freedom. So in this particular case, what degrees of freedom we want to have tied together would be translation in X and translation in Y. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove these other degrees of freedom. And then we'll say select point and we'll go ahead and select that work point. So now you can see all the lines of our rigid connector come into a single common point and then connect out to the surface there that we had selected prior. And by defining TX and TY, what that says is whatever this node does in terms of TX and TY, transfer those movements into uh, this particular face here. So it's tying those degrees of freedom together. Okay, so we'll go ahead and say OK. And we just need to repeat that process on the other end of the model. So it uh, gives you an opportunity to see it all again. Let's go ahead and choose connectors. And from the connector, again, we're going to change. You can see we do have different types of connectors available. And, and we'll talk about some of these other types of connectors in, in other presentations. But for what we need here, we're, we're going to choose the rigid body. The type is rigid. I'm going to click in the box to select my dependent entities. I will select that face. Again, tell it what degrees of freedom I want to control. Click in the box that says select point and select our common point. And there we go. There's the connection. Hopefully you can see the lines coming out to that center point there. OK, so let's go ahead and say OK. And again, the reason we did that is because we want this shaft to be able to act as if it is simply supported. And since the shaft itself, the solid elements, don't have rotational degrees of freedom, this is one way that we can accommodate that. And we're going to do that specifically now with the constraints that we're going to assign. So the next thing that we are going to do is we're going to go into constraints go to the constraints pull down menu select constraints and when I select my constraints what I'm going to do is select that common node there and at the common node let me select that common node or work point one what we're going to do is say no translation so we're locking down the translations of this point but we are allowing rotation about that point so because the rigid connector is capable of all six degrees of freedom what I can do is allow my rotational degrees of freedom at that work point, and then that translates into uh, the, the structure or the geometry. Let's rotate our model around, and we will select our other work point, and we'll say OK. So that gives us the boundary conditions, the connector and the boundary conditions on the geometry that will allow this model to be able to to bend or flex like a, a simply supported beam. All right, at this point, let me go ahead and just do a save on the model. We've done a little bit of work. Make sure that that is saved. Now, the other thing that we have to do as far as constraints is uh, we have to tell the program about the fact that we've sliced the model, right? So we have this symmetry plane right here. And the way we're going to handle that is to go to constraints again. And when I go to constraints, again, you can just check the boxes. If I want TX constrained, I leave the check mark there. If I want to free up or allow the model to translate next, then I remove it. And then you have a bunch of uh, quick buttons here. So I can say fixed. And if I click that, then all the check boxes uh, become filled. There's my no translation or fixing translation. I can set them free. So all the boxes become unchecked, you have a no rotation. But then below that you have your symmetry. So again, I want this face. And when I choose the symmetry plane, the, the symmetry that I want to apply here, or which one I 
choose is based on whatever vector is perpendicular to the cut surface. And in this case, that is the Z symmetry. All right, so I, when I select the symmetry Z, you can see that it's going to automatically set constraints for TZ, the out of plane translation, and then the two in plane rotations. And before I okay that, let me just make sure that Z is perpendicular. Yes, that is the correct direction. And maybe I'll assign a name to that just in case I need to find it in the menu tree later. So let's say Z symmetry and okay. All right, so I have my constraints here allowing the rotation of the rigid connectors and, and ultimately of the shaft itself. I have my, my Z symmetry accounted for. So I think the next thing that we need to do is uh, apply the load on the model or on the geometry. So this again is where we split the surfaces here so that we can apply the load at the proper point given the, the description of the setup. So I'm gonna go to loads and we're gonna select that edge. And in this case, uh, the load in the setup of the problem was described for us as 6,800 newtons, 6,800 newtons of, of force. Um, but uh, in this case, since we only have half of the geometry, what we want to do is reduce the load by half. So we're going to define this as minus 3,400 newtons. It's a little bit different depending on whether you are using a force or a pressure. If we're assigning a pressure to the surface, let's say the description of our setup said apply 2,000 pounds uh, per square inch around this surface. Well, I would still apply the same magnitude in terms of pressure because by the fact that I removed half of the uh, geometry that would remove half of the square area and then the load would be uh, self-adjusting if you will. But in the case of forces that occur on the plane of symmetry, yes, you would need to reduce the magnitude of the load by half if it's a half symmetry or a quarter if it's a quarter symmetry model and, and so on. Okay, let's go ahead and we will say okay to that. So there's our load on the model. And because we know that uh, our high stresses are probably going to occur in the regions of the fillets, we are going to add some mesh control to get a finer mesh in those regions. So let's access our mesh control. And we are going to use face data. And we're going to set the mesh size in the regions of the fillets to 0 0.5 millimeters. And then I'll click in the box to select the faces. And I'm going to select the four little fillets on our geometry. OK. All right. So that way we can get a refined mesh in those regions. Let's say OK. And we need to mesh the model overall. I'm going to go into Mesh Settings. We're going to utilize a, a mesh size here of five millimeters and generate mesh. So we should have a five millimeter mesh on most of the model and that 0.5 or much finer mesh in the areas of the fillets. Say so, okay. And there we go. We can see that finer mesh and then it transitions out away from there. All right, I think at this point, we are all set to run our analysis. So let's go ahead and hit the run button. Okay, our analysis has completed. Let's take a look at our results. Uh, first, we'll take a look at displacement and we expect our displacement to be around uh, 1.4 millimeters. I'll go into displacement and there we can see 1.385 and let's also take a look at our displaced shape so we can see that there's a nice continuous bend to our geometry like it's a simply supported beam so um, that is one of the things that we were talking about throughout this particular lesson was taking a look at your results and making sure that the the magnitude of displacement looks appropriate and that the shape the display shape of the geometry looks appropriate. Um, 
and if not then there is you know a, a decent chance that it might come back to something with the setup of your constraints we can also check the uh, stresses while we're here uh, let me go ahead and switch over to a stress and we're going to take a look at our max principal stress solid max principal and we expect that to be about 368 Okay, so 368.3, and we can see that it does occur in that region of that fillet, which is one of the reasons that we refined that region of the model, but otherwise, all looking good. And then the last thing that we'll illustrate with this model is one of the other things that you can do on the topic of, of constraints is that you have loads applied to your model, right? And those loads should propagate through your model to your constraints and then ultimately you get reactions at your constraints. So one of the other good things about constraints is that you can check your reactions at the constraints. And if you recall, we had applied uh, minus uh, 3,400 Newtons. So that's what I expect to see out of the model. So I can come over to my menu tree, select the constraint here, right click on that and do an SPC summation and make sure that my reactions uh, are equivalent to the load I put in. So we can see that uh, the total is 3,399, just about uh, 3,400, which is what we put into the model, and it's in the y direction. We had our load uh, in the minus y direction, so that all checks out as well. Okay, thanks for watching.